Good morning and welcome to this, our public worship service here at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with one of our retired pastors, Reverend John Roth, leading our morning worship. It is pleasing to have John with us this morning, but regrettably he remains affected by seasonal change and weather, uh, as we've evidenced in these past weeks. Therefore, he appreciates some assistance in the leading of our worship as much as we appreciate his presence with us this morning. As always, we commend to you those undergoing difficulties. We think of John and Lynn Tucker undergoing trial. Lynn was hospitalised this past week and diagnosed with pneumonia. Uh, she remains in hospital, but thankfully is responding to treatment. But this obviously affects uh, both John and Lynn, and so your prayers for them is greatly encouraged. Gordon is undergoing daily treatment uh, in this past week. This is his third week, two more weeks to go. Uh, and Wendy is still recovering from a series of health challenges as well. So we trust these will be resolved in these coming weeks. Uh, dear Lynette continues to recover from a recent medical procedure. Uh, this will be ongoing for some weeks yet. Uh, she's on a restricted diet and uh, under the management of Richard. And so we do pray for both uh, uh, Lynette and Richard at this time. We commend also to you the man's family, as always. Uh, to your prayerful concern. On a very pleasant note, we rejoice with Martin and Judy on the safe arrival of another grandchild. A daughter, Sarah, gave birth to a son, Jackson Maxwell. So we do rejoice that mother and child are well. We think of others who are undergoing measures of treatment or recovery. We think of Richard and Anne, and we think of dear Dan as well. Uh, last week, I mentioned that uh, Miss Jean Millard was in palliative care. Uh, we've now been advised that Jean passed to be with the Lord last Tuesday evening at 11.30pm. A funeral service will be held in Townsville tomorrow, uh, Monday 19th of August at 11am. The service will be live streamed and those details are available for any who may wish to participate. So please remember her cousin Bonnie in your prayers. She <laughs> ministered to Jean over many years and she will have to deal with uh, not only uh, the coming funeral service, but also this separation for so long. As we also advised last Sunday, consistent with duty of care compliance, it is the Committee of Management's intention to undertake an evacuation practice drill this morning following worship. Therefore, following the conclusion of morning worship, all present are requested to be seated and await the formal announcement of the evacuation. Following that, we'll gather together again for morning tea in the hall. We're all encouraged to stay for that further time of fellowship. This evening, for worship as usual, uh, with her own pastor leading that time of, of worship. Just the activities for the coming week, our Thursday evening Bible study via Zoom as usual, 7 p.m. We just note that uh, that study will soon be starting a new series of studies on the book of Hebrews, and there'll be notes available very soon so please keep tuned for that. Next Saturday morning will be our regular prayer meeting as usual. Next Sunday service, as God willing, will be as usual, morning and evening, and led by our own Pastor Martin. We just note that the Lord's Supper will be celebrated at both morning and evening worship on Sunday the 1st of September. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to our call to worship. Thank you. Thank you. This morning comes from Psalm 96, verses 8 to 10. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. 
Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, our fathers taught us from your word that the whole duty of man is to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. We acknowledge this duty is not burdensome, but is most pleasant for us as your people, as we have some comprehension of your supreme greatness. Your attributes and characteristics are beyond our full comprehension, yet we have experienced in some measure your might, holiness, faithfulness and mercy. We look forward to the day when we shall worship you as we ought, yet for now we apply ourselves to worship you as we are able. As we gather in this sanctuary this morning, may your glory be manifested in some degree in our praise, prayer, reading of your word and the proclamation. May it please you to receive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose worship of you was most perfect and most acceptable. Amen. Our first uh, hymn of praise this morning is uh, Stand Up and Bless the Lord, Ye People of His Choice. join together in a season of prayer. Almighty God, this morning we have sought your face with the consideration of your glory and your word instructs us in the manner in which we can glorify your name. As we enter this new week, we reflect on the past week as much as we are able, that we might confess our sin, 
and genuinely repent. We are told that praying in the name of the Lord Jesus glorifies you. If in any manner our prayers in this past week have been cold and formal, empty of real concern, or if we have rarely prayed, or prayed only when we are desperate, with little thanksgiving, and if our intention of the Lord Jesus' name to conclude our prayer had no sense of the significance and authority that his name gives to our prayers, please forgive us. Your word tells us that bearing fruit gives glory to your name. We thank you for the justification found in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we have failed to cooperate with the Spirit in the work of sanctification, the setting apart of ourselves unto you more and more, if we have ignored conviction of error, refused correction, remaining content in our own ways, please forgive us. We are told that whether we eat or drink, or whatever we do, ensure that it is all to your glory. This instruction tells us that the simplest and most routine of actions can glorify you or not. We are bound to seek the good of others, not to cause needless offence or discouragement, to forsake our own comfort and be helpful and generous to others. Again, forgive us if we have not done unto others that which we would have done unto ourselves. Giving generously glorifies you. If in any way we did not give or share when we could have, when we should have, we held back for selfish reasons or critical reasons. If we had been generous, others may have praised your name. Forgive us if this is the case. You are glorified when our daily lives manifest good works despite unjust criticism. In this past week, have we forsaken opportunities to manifest helpful actions to others, been so absorbed with our own lives, or worse, displayed conduct that was lacking in grace and love toward others? Please forgive us and grant us enabling grace to let our light shine before men that they may glorify you. See our hearts, that our desire is to live before you in obedience to the glory of your name. We confess these and our other sins for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 12. So our first reading uh, from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 12, and reading from verse 1 through to verse 9. Let us hear the word of God. Now the Lord said, had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moriah. And the Canaanites were there then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, 
and he pitched his tent with Bethel on his west and Ai on his east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Amen. Our second opportunity to praise this morning. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love.
reading this morning comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Thank you, James and Matthias. Let us come to uh, give thanks to God for the opportunity to present an offering and to pray for some people. Heavenly Father, it is a, a great privilege to come before you in prayer that we can come to this uh, local congregation and uh, worship you without uh, fear at the present time. Although through the years and even in other places, if Christians who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ gather together, they gather with fear around them. But let us not fear, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, as delivered to us in the scripture, is a wonderful story of the facts that God has done in Christ to make us presentable to God in heaven without our works without anything in us to deserve any good thing. We thank you, Lord, because of what you have given and what you have done in Christ. This clearly separates true Christianity from every religion on earth. Because every religion on earth requires some kind of deserving, nature in the person, in the candidate who would enter heaven. There are many, our Lord, who give thanks to you for deliverance from death and near misses from bullets and acknowledge there is a God. In fact, everyone knows in their heart, if they're genuine, honest with themselves, that God is. But the message of Jesus Christ is what is key. For none of us are ever saved unless we have a belief in God 
through Christ as Abraham did. He didn't know you so clearly, and yet he believed you, God, when you spoke to him. And the scripture says in Genesis and Galatians that that belief, that trust in God, was accounted to him for righteousness. Thank you, Lord, that we have opportunity to give to you through our talents, our treasures and our time to be able to provide a kind of a ministry that you have given to us that is suitable for our circumstances. We thank you for this and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Now let us sing the, uh, the third hymn. Rise up, O men of God, that includes all of us. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. opportunity to be able to uh, preach for a few Sundays and we've been preaching through parts of Revelation that relate to the, the central fact of Jesus Christ to our salvation and the church. And I'd like to speak today about one tiny aspect of the famous phrase that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And if you read the, uh, uh, the front cover on the, the bulletin from Matthew Henry that Christine, I think, has put there, uh, he, he describes this clearly also, and I could just finish there and we can go home. Uh, but we shall preach. And I'd like to speak in a slightly different way, but let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the precious fact that we are justified by grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves. We cannot be justified by keeping Moses' law in the sight of God. And Paul says that's evident. But it's not so clear for most people today. Help us to understand some of these things as we read this scripture we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
It was some 500 years ago. Uh, Europe was in a very bad way. Uh, something was radically wrong with the church that was predominantly centred in Rome and that church ruled over the nations of Europe. The lives of ordinary people in European countries were threatened by two major menaces from outside the church. One was the bubonic plague that raged for centuries and the other was the Muslim Ottoman Turks who captured Gallipoli in 1354 and began their advance into Europe. And a hundred years later, Constantinople fell to Islam in 1453, and Negro Ponte in 1470, and by 1480, which is about 40 years before the Reformation in 1517, in 1480, uh, the Islamic army landed at, Rot at Otranto in Italy and killed 12,000 inhabitants. They were encouraged to believe in Allah, but 800 were beheaded for not converting. And by the year 1500, the church was corrupt, it was adding works to the gospel, there was the plague, and there was this other predominant religion that was endeavouring to convert Christians, and people no longer read the Bible. They were afraid. They were trusting in their own ability to bring themselves near to God, or at least take them near enough so God might accept them. Because they're uh, hearing the message, as God is loving, if you do good, he'll take you in. 500 years ago, they had come so far from the truth. The truth was that man was sinful and very distant from God, but what God did in Christ Jesus, he came all the way to find mankind 500 years ago. 500 years ago, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation began to realise that the old gospel of grace, which had been forgotten, had to be brought again into the minds of the people. Christianity had to be renovated or reformed or restored by this saying, the just shall live by faith. Now what went wrong in history? It's going wrong in our history. The same thing. Whereas countries are drifting away from reading the word, attending to worship, afraid of Islam, afraid of everything, afraid of making Jesus Christ as he is the centre of all belief. As always happens, over time people turn away from the Lord God and begin to listen to false teachers who teach not a God-centred faith but a self-centred kind of religion. <clears throat> The Church of Rome that had spread throughout Europe <coughs> accepted the authority of Scripture <coughs> but they added works as a source of faith. This always happens. The traditions as expressed in the decrees of the elite were considered to be the only infallible interpreter of the Scripture. The elite they rise up in the party of the Democrats in the US or whatever party could be in Moscow or whatever. They rise up and they can tell a president, you're not running and we'll give you someone else. 
The elite think they know better than, for example, a Christian who reads his scripture in the church. But what was happening then was that the Bible was hardly ever read. And when people did try to read it, they were told, you don't understand what it really means. And they could not discern truth from lies. <clears throat> but the reformers such as Luther and Calvin rejected the authority of the papal elite. They rejected the merit of good works. They rejected indulgences which were supposedly, if they were purchased, able to shorten your time in purgatory. They rejected the mediation of the Virgin Mary and the saints and all sacraments which had not been directly commanded by Christ. Christ commanded two sacraments to us and we practice those two, whereas the Church of Rome practice seven. They rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation, the teaching that the bread and the wine actually became the body and blood of Christ when the priests consecrated them. They rejected purgatory. They rejected private confession of sin to a priest. They rejected the celibacy of the clergy and the use of Latin in the services. They rejected statues and idols and the like. What was important was that salvation came by the free and undeserved grace of Christ Jesus. And this came to be known as justification by faith alone or by faith only. Or as the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. It was the action of God alone in the death and resurrection of Christ. God called us from rebellion against God to a new life in Christ. The church at Rome at the time believed that a person was saved by grace, but also they had to add good works. Good works were made parallel to faith and they laid stress on the merit of good works. And we fall into the same error if we think that only good people become Christians. Sinners and outright sinners are called by God to be justified through Christ Jesus. Now, I don't deny good works. They're, they're a product or an evidence of justification. But we are confronted today by the same fears that the people of Europe had nearly <coughs> 500 years ago. And Martin Luther, on the 31st of October, 1517, nailed a notice to the cathedral door at Wittenberg, attacking the teaching behind the sale of indulgences and the church's material preoccupations. He pronounced that we are justified not by our deeds, but by faith alone. That is where the true wealth of the church lies. And if we Presbyterians lose an awful lot of property and the like, then praise God, because the church is centered in justification by faith through Christ. Now nothing much has changed since the beginning of the creation. What the devil tempted the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, he tempted them to depart from the Word of God. He tempted them to be woke people. I am unwoke. He tempted them to be progressive. But we are meant to be founded upon the Scripture, the Word of God. By the time of the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, the same attitude <coughs> was among the people there. Uh, by the time of 1500 AD, there was corruption in the church, corruption in government, disease was everywhere, the viruses were running rampant, and they feared a Muslim invasion. And we live 
uh, 500 plus years after that, but there's the same evidence of failure and fear that is still with us, together with the fear of an Islamic invasion. But also the same God and Saviour of the world is near to us to save. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3.1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Who bewitched you? Who deceived you? That people did all in their power to contradict the message of the gospel that had first been preached to the Galatians through the Apostle Paul. That area of Galatia today is completely Muslim. Galatia is in modern Turkey. These people in Paul's time had been taught the truth about Jesus Christ, but others came in who were progressive, contradicting everything about Christ that they had been taught. And the new Christians <coughs> listened to these false teachers and took it in without testing it. If they had searched the scriptures of the Old Testament, because as said in the newsletter, the New Testament, once we understand it, we see Christ in the Old Testament everywhere. If they had searched the scripture, they would have known that the disciples were speaking the truth about Jesus Christ and the Jewish false teachers would not have had any opportunity to deceive them. So Paul says in 3.1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? In other words, who has cast an evil eye on you as victims? The false teachers control the minds of believers through fear. And that's the greatest thing I've struck as a pastor in the church from someone who comes out of a priestly system to come into the church. They're full of fear lest they'll lose what they thought they had. Now fear, I'm not speaking very plainly but I'm doing that for a reason. But fear affects people. But the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ came to cast out fear and replace it with faith. Now false teachers try to abolish faith and in so doing they bring fear upon us. Such fear is that people will say, well if I don't work hard, then I won't be saved. They say, yes, God saved you by his grace, but you must also try hard to keep the Ten Commandments. And if you fail to do that, you will be lost. Now this is sometimes seen as a, a failing in Christianity, as if giving people permission to go and do whatever they like. It is not. Because <coughs> Jesus Christ has saved us by grace through faith. He, he died once and once only for sin. He cannot be crucified a second time over and over again at altars by priests. There is a hint here that the Galatians were so filled with fear by the false teachers that they not only rejected the grace of God but they shamefully crucified Christ among themselves again and again and again. They began thinking in their heart, they began imagining that Christ should be crucified over and over again. But Christ was crucified once on Calvary's cross. And when we as a people of God receive that gospel, we find deliverance from the fear of hell and of death. We might be unsure, because I lack assurance a lot of times, and I'm sure if people were honest, you, you would know that there are times when you lack it. But the one thing I'm very sure of is that Christ died for his people. 
He died for the elect and that will not fail. But if you go back to works again, after having known of Jesus Christ, the scripture says they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. Remember how Christ said <coughs> on the cross, it is finished. It meant that he'd completed all the work, he finished all the work. So those who seek to continue to be justified by keeping Moses' law, the Ten Commandments, and doing good works, and not only denying Christ, but crucifying him anew. Now, false religion always denies Christ in some way and adds something that seems reasonable to the human mind. One of my mother's sisters was a Jehovah Witness and she plainly taught, yes, Christ saves us, but unless you witness for that certain number of hours a year, you are not a Jehovah Witness. I, I challenge people at the door, how many hours a year must you work in order to be saved? And they tell me a number. Now this is where the Galatian uh, Christians began to go astray. They began to think, well, I have to do something for myself. So Paul says in Galatians 3, 2, I think, <clears throat> did you receive uh, the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Was it <coughs> by keeping to the law and doing ritual? Or was it by what is called the hearing of faith? Now the Galatian Christians, Galatia, Gentiles, mostly non-Jews, they didn't have the law. So they received the Spirit as a gift of God, not by doing good works. So I was at a meeting the other night and it was a secular meeting and I was chairing it and I said, oh, I nearly closed with prayer. <laughs> Nothing to do with church. And um, a fellow's wife said, I don't mind. I was raised in a Christian school, but my husband won't like it. But he's a very nice fellow, extremely good fellow, a lovely man. He helps us a great deal. Doesn't know anything about the Old Testament. He doesn't know anything about the things of God. So the Galatian, the Galatian, the, the Gentiles didn't know much about the Old Testament, but the Jews did. They knew these things. And those who were saved, when they were told about Jesus Christ and how he fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament, they believed. And they believed by the grace of God, the gift of God, not by anything we have earned. Now Romans chapter 8 says around verse 15, says that we receive the Spirit of God because of Christ and all he has done. It says the Spirit is life to us. It says in 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. <coughs> the Spirit of God comes to us by the faith of Christ, not by the fear of the law, for law brings fear, law brings death. Luke verifies this statement of Paul in the book of Acts, uh, somewhere around Acts 10.44, while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, he says in Acts 11.15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning, not by law, but by grace, through faith. Another question arises in verse 5 of Galatians 3. How did the Apostle Paul minister? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Obviously, by faith by hearing it. Paul reminds them <clears throat> that they not only received the Spirit by the 
preaching of the gospel, but by the same gospel they were enabled to do things. And what things we ask? Well, miracles, that's what Paul did. At least the Galatians had taken for granted the, the fruit of faith, which true disciples of the gospel demonstrated in those days. And it's by the power of God. Uh, Paul was not a great preacher. He wrote powerful letters, but he, he's a bit like me, I can't preach. But uh, he had a real stutter and a stumble, and, uh, but he demonstrated the supernatural ability of the Holy Spirit. And when the gospel is preached unto faith and hope and love and patience, God gives his wonder-working spirit. The Galatian people loved Paul so much, he says in 4.15, he says, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Indication he might have had very bad eyesight. <coughs> they had such devotion uh, to him. A and they were ready to, uh, to give money and goods, even eyes, in order to secure his salvation. Now such love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Their experience should have taught them that the fruits of love do not grow on the stump of the law. The law doesn't show us so much about the love of God. If there had been any honesty left in them, they would have confessed that their freedom dates from the preaching of the gospel that says the just or the justified shall live by faith. In Galatians 3.6, it uh, repeats uh, one of my central saving verses, uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And I debated this with a previous pastor when I was a communicant. And um, after I debated it with him, he just recommended me to Bible college, the Baptist Bible college. And he came to work to see me and he said, I'm sorry I recommended you. I disagree with you entirely. And it was all on this particular matter about Abraham believing God. Because 3 6 says, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know you therefore, that's us, know us, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's us, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, 2000 BC, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, nations ethnics, all families of the earth be blessed. Now history shows that keeping the law and doing good works does not bring salvation. Now the Jews regarded Abraham as their father. A God had given to Abraham promises of land, a seed and a blessing. From the river Euphrates to the sea, God gave that land to the Jews and to Israel. Not as you see the opposition today. Now even in Jesus' day, the Jews regarding themselves as Abraham's seed. And the Lord uses this fact in Galatians to show how God justified Abraham. Abraham was justified by grace through faith, not by works of righteousness. It says in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He simply trusted God and God accounted to him righteousness and it was through Christ who was to come. Although Abraham did meet Christ as he, he and the angels were on the way to destroy Sodom. Now when God declares you righteous, you have nothing to pay. You have no accusations that will stand against you. You are free to serve God in a loving and a grateful way. Abraham believed God and God accounted that faith to Abraham for righteousness. <coughs> that is the greatest message 
of all time. The important thing to note is that is this happened hundreds of years before the law and commandments were given to Moses on Sinai, six, seven hundred years before. Abraham was accepted by God simply because he believed. Abraham took God at his word by faith. So when we read the scripture, that's God's word. And we believe it, even though we can't see it. Faith alone marked Abraham's acceptance by God. Now, there's something important here in Galatians 4 verse, 7, 4 verse 7. Know you therefore, he says, know this, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So we are children, not by lineage, but by faith. God blessed Abraham because of faith. Verse 8 says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now Abraham is called the father of the Jews. All the rest were called heathen. They are from all the other nations of the world. Yet nearly 2,000 years before Christ came into the world by birth, God promised to Abraham that in thee or in you shall all nations be blessed. Russians, Chinese, Chileans, all over the world. This is said in Galatians 3.8 and is quoted from Genesis 12.3. Out of all the nations of the world, which was about 400 years after the Great Flood, 300 years after the Tower of Babel, uh, God came to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees. At that time, the ancestral family of the Chinese were headed east. The ancestors of the Australian Aboriginal had made their way towards the great south land called Australia. This is 4,000 years ago, according to the Bible. Abraham was living in the Middle East and God came to him and to him alone and gave him a promise. And he said, in you shall all nations be blessed. Now God didn't specify how the blessing would come to all nations until we read the New Testament and understand it in the light of the cross of Christ. Through Abraham's physical line of descendants came Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he made God's gift of salvation available to all nations of the world. And that gift was not limited to Jews. And it could not be earned it was a gift to all nations. This is the gift of Christ. Abraham took God at his word and trusted him. In the same way the people of other nations that can receive God's blessings by faith in Christ. So whether you are the descendants of Japheth, the son of Noah, who is the father of the northern peoples, or you might be a descendant of Ham, the southern and African peoples, or a descendant of Shem, the eastern and middle eastern peoples, the Far East. We all have access into God's blessings by faith, by trusting God and accepting him at his word. But there is a curse mentioned in the scripture. This is the negative part. Uh, verse 10 in Galatians there. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now the curse of God is like a flood that swallows everything that's not of faith. To avoid the curse we must hold on to the promise of blessing in Christ. Those who trust in their ability to keep the law of Moses are under God's curse. Now we ought to respect God's law. Our life depends on us 
knowing how serious a situation in which we find ourselves. Now, those who try to keep God's law in order to receive salvation from God will be greatly disappointed. For salvation is by God's grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the law of God, Moses' law, the Ten Commandments, if you go back to that. We try to keep them and we can't. And this drives us to Christ. But the fact is we cannot please God by keeping his law. We please God by believing in God through Christ Jesus. However, we're not to be lawless. We are not to be pr as proud unbelievers who, having read God's word, just cast it away. There was a certain king of Judah, King Jehoiakim. He did this. When they, uh, when they found the word of God, God sent him a message to repent through Jeremiah the prophet. And when the word of God was read to Jehoiakim, he had the pages cut and burned as they were read. Now some pleaded with him not to burn God's word, but he was not afraid. He didn't tear his garments in repentance. My father told me that when he departed for PNG to fight the Emperor's men in World War II, they were given Bibles. But many of the men just tore the pages out and rolled their cigarettes. And Jehoiakim did the same. We are not to be like that. We are to be a people of faith like Abraham was. And the blessing we receive through faith is salvation through Christ Jesus. Now it seems incredible. But God will save any sinner and bring him or her into heaven because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a genuine belief. It's incredible, it's simple, yet for many it's so impossible. But God will give us the gift of repentance, he will soften our hearts so that we may turn away from our sins and cling to Christ. And verse 10 looks at the curse, but verse 11 has the positive side. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And that's a quote from Habakkuk 2.4 in the Old Testament. Justification and eternal life come by faith. It is a reasonable conclusion that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, because the law was never meant to justify us, but the law is still perfect. It is God's will. It is God's thinking. Therefore we must approach God by faith in Christ. For it is Christ who delivered us from the curse of the law in verses 13 and 14. Which says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. So that God's blessing might come to us through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now in conclusion, salvation is a gift of God and it's only through Christ, through faith by God's grace and that was discovered 500 years ago and has been lost and is gradually being lost. But there are God's people who are responding to the fact that Christ fully satisfied through his death the requirements of God's perfect law on our behalf. It also fully satisfied the righteous demands of God that lay behind the law. Therefore his death was <coughs> sufficient to bring blessing to both Jews and Gentiles to the nationalities of the world. By faith we believe the promises of God and by his spirit many blessings are received by faith alone. Faith alone builds on the promises of God and we must trust God for our protection, for our family security and our nation's defence. Now Moses 
was told by God this very thing. Deuteronomy 18.15 And a certain religion has misinterpreted this entirely. But Moses was told this, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet in the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, and unto him you shall hearken or hear. The New Testament says that is Jesus Christ. The Muslim says that is Muhammad. That prophet has come and he is the Lord Jesus Christ who brought better things than the law of Moses. He brought grace and truth and remission of sins so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everla everlasting Father, you have life in your possession through Jesus Christ Lord Jesus you grant life to as many as believe and as we pass through that door we do see that we have always belonged to God's elect the two seem to be totally opposite but they work together well in the mind of God we need to believe these things and trust you for our own salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us sing the concluding hymn which uh, speaks about having the mind of Christ, our Saviour. of God which passeth all understanding may keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and may the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. <laughs>